Well, I'm excited to be joined by author and researcher Hugh Newman uh, today. Hugh has written several books such as Stone Circles, uh, Megalithic Studies in Stones, and Giants on Record, among others. Hugh, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. Yes, thanks for having me on, Dee. I appreciate it. In your uh, video series, and again, uh, for our audience, you got to go to Megalithomania YouTube channel and check out Hugh's uh, video series on the Olmec recently, but you feature so many great, uh, you know, Olmec artifacts from the Mexico City Museum of Anthropology. I want to ask you about a couple of them, but was there one that just fascinated you most in the Mexico City Museum there? there there's, there's quite a lot there, to be honest with you. They've got a good selection there. It's quite impressive, actually. They've got, they've got you know, like I said, they've got two Olmec heads. But what one fascinated me the most, I, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't, I mean, Monument 19 is probably the most fascinating Olmec artifact carving of them all because it depicts what looks like a gentleman in profile holding a, like one of those man bags um, with a serpent, a plume serpent going around him. And he looks like he's in some kind of device, almost like the lid of Palenque, like Lord Pacal's tomb. Uh, so that is absolutely fascinating. And I think the original is on display in that museum. They have a copy at Leventa site and a copy at Leventa um, Villa Hermosa, uh, the park there. Um, but that is really interesting and in that has all sorts of symbolism. And it's the oldest depiction of a plumed serpent. And this was then became big, big kind of religious thing in Mayan, Toltec, Mixtec, um, Teotihuacan and uh, Aztec worlds after that. And so they may have been the first to kind of bring this tradition of the plumed serpent or Quetzalcoatl or Cuckoo Clan or different names given to him by different cultures. Uh, and that really became strong during Toltec times. Um, so the fact that you've got the original piece there with all this symbolism uh, there was way before anything else is really, really interesting. It's, it's also the quality of the stone carving is insane. It's like what you find in the peak of, you know, stone technology in Egypt. You're finding that here. This is why I think there's a connection because you look at the style quality of the stonework as well but if you go to the if you go to the national museum anthropology museum in mexico city you've got olmec head you've got one of their graves one of the tombs made of these basalt columns found from leventa you've got um you've got the tuxla statuette which is like a jadeite piece like this big you know it's like this big and that was found uh, not at a particular olmec site but it's got all these calendar carvings on it and so forth with this sort of cleft lip and this sort of half man, half kind of animal. Um, and there's also one called the wrestler as well, which is almost like this um, Asian looking gentleman kind of in a yoga pose, almost like he's started to wrestle, but he's got a moustache, a beard. Um, and it's just one piece of stone, but it's carved beautifully. It's about, it's about three feet tall. And so there's, there's a few amazing pieces that's worth checking out. But if, if people want to see a whole load of Olmec stuff in Europe at the moment, there's a big exhibition going on in Paris where many of these, um, many of these Olmec um, kind of pieces have been moved to. So Halapa Museum and some pieces from... Um, the National Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City are, in, are over there at the moment. So some of them aren't there in Mexico. So it's worth noting that if you're going to be in Mexico, there's a few pieces that are missing. Yeah, I was fascinated by several of these artifacts that you referenced in the museum. Yeah, the wrestler that looks clearly oriental. Um, you've got, I think there was a guy named Almano or a, an artifact named Almano who's got this big elongated skull. And then there was all the little jade uh, miniature uh, figurines. It had seemed to have really large elongated skulls. And then I think you called it column two. It was like a humanoid looking figure that had those bulbous features, you would say, with almost sunglasses he was wearing. Do you think there might, the skull elongation of the, of the Olmec, could that have been more than just cradle headboarding? Could there be genetic markers in there, maybe like we see in Paracas, Peru, with some of those skulls? Possible, yeah, that's one thing um, worth considering. I mean, the problem with this part of the world is uh, the humid kind of um, climate here just destroys all the bones. And so there's very few skulls. Some have survived, but these are from later than the Olmec times. But there are some other skulls found further south that have obvious signs of cranial deformation, trepanning, 
and some are, some like you find in Paracas, uh, different parts of Peru, Bolivia are oversized elongation. It's like they're much bigger, and wider, or longer than they should be if it was a normal skull being altered from birth. And so this has raised quite a few questions, and there's some very strange looking skulls. Um, which really have no explanation. We know the Star Child skull, I believe, was found in Mexico, and that's that's caused a huge sensation. There's a very similar one in Paracas, in Peru. Um, um, and so, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, one of there is a whole ancient aliens element to this that a lot of people talk about. That the fact that the Olmec culture just emerged from nowhere, it just was fully fledged, fully advanced stone carving technology, um, just arrived boom, they, they knew what they were doing and they influenced all the cultures thereafter. They brought a very sophisticated calendar with them. There's proof now that they invented the long count calendar that supposedly ended on December the 21st, 2012. There's also evidence they invented the Zolkin sacred 260 day calendar, which uh, represents um, the gestation cycle, but it's also the sacred calendar. Um, and they kind of synchronize every 52 years uh which is when they would rebuild pyramids the whole fire ceremony and so forth and so there's a lot of these things that got taken from the Olmec into the mayan world and they were obviously a big influence but whether the skulls are naturally like that is just a big mystery no one really knows but there's so many depictions of this elongation that either they were all cradle boarding themselves or they just looked like that is it true that no um skeletons of the Olmec have been found that we know of? Not officially. I mean, because of, the, you know, further south, yes. In actual Olmec land, very few bones have been found because of the climate, the humidity, uh, the dampness just disintegrates the bones, unfortunately. So it's very, so that is, that is a pity because, but they have found Olmec sites like Chalcatzingo, which is south of Mexico City. You've got Tlatilco, in Mexico City, which has been destroyed now. You've got Zacacatla, that's also south of Mexico City, and um, Cuernavaca, the town city. And you've got um, Chimalacatlan and other sites, which appear, some of them have got bones and skeletons from, some of them are elongated skulls, but we don't know if they're original Olmec skulls and bones and skeletons. So there's a big question mark about that still. It was very interesting in your, uh, I think it was your last video you posted about the Olmex in the uh, Mexico City Museum of Anthropology. There was like two uh, humanoid type looking skulls. I think you said they might have dated to 5000 BC. Uh, one almost looked Cro-Magnum like. Are those related in any way to Olmec or do you think that's totally separate? I'm not sure because they, I think they were found near Puebla, which is you know, was an Olmec area, but because of the dating, it, it, officially the earlier than the Olmec, but they're unusual because that type of scarlet type of feature uh, wasn't supposed to be in Mexico at that time. So they're, they're an anomaly, but there are other skulls in the museum which are fully elongated. There are some that have got giant jaws, like we find with some of the giants that we've been researching. And these ones almost seem like they're anomalous. You know, who were these people? Were they were they kind of explorers or travelers from a different culture? Were they connected with Quetzalcoatl? Because the traditions say that he arrived potentially that long ago, because the official long count calendar, who the Olmecs worked with first, dates to 3,114 BC. So that's 5,000 years ago. Even though these could be older than that. And so, yeah, who they were, we don't know, but they're one of the anomalies. I mean, imagine what else is hidden down in, you know, the basements, and back rooms, and museums. The, what we're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, one more question about the Olmecs. Um, you've written and talked about in some of your uh, presentations about, I think it's the Cunamensian giants of the Gulf Coast of Mexico. And there's even this old drawing of locals killing one the there's old newspaper reports i believe about you know 13 and 15 foot like giant skeletons being found in this area could that giant tribe be connected to the Olmec in any way or is that separate as well no it could be it could be that there, there, there is i mean some people even think the quinamets and giants are the Olmecs. that is one of the that is, it's, it's very confusing like i've been looking into 
me and JJ have been looking into this actually, looking into the, the different, the old, the, the five worlds of that the Aztecs and the Mayans talked about um, and before them. And they're going back to the different worlds, there was a t- and there were different destruction, different types of destruction. One of the oldest worlds was where uh, the Quinnemets and Giants, they built places like Teotihuacan, Chalu, and other sites, um, and they got destroyed by a flood. But other stories say, and interpretations suggest, they were actually destroyed and, and uh, killed off by the Olmecs when they came in. And so we've got, we've start, just started looking into this, and we're looking at different theories on this. So whether they were the same people, we don't know, but they might have been separate cultures battling each other. Um but the Quinnemetsin are really interesting. The, the image you talk about is from Codex Vaticanus, and that shows a whole bunch of locals just basically killing a giant and tearing his guts out and things like this. It's pretty scary. But they go back to a really early era, this idea of the Quinnemetsin giants. Officially, you know, in tradition, they were the builders of Teotihuacan. They were the builders of Cholula, which then got taken over and became a Quetzalcoatl dedicated plumed serpent pyramid. Um, they were even uh, linked with Tlaloc. Tlaloc, the, the rain god, um, amongst other things, he was, although he became famous really later, you know, because of the Tlaloc statue, which was found in Lake Texcoco, uh, was an Aztec thing, even though it's dated to earlier than the Aztecs. He was around at the time of Teal to at least 2,000 years ago, because he's actually depicted there multiple times on the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl, as well as um, other, other statues. Uh, and he was said to be the king or the leader of the Quinnemets and giants. So he was a giant himself, clearly, and he's depicted as, as so. Um, interestingly, there are other statues found at Teotihuacan. There's there's one that was the consort uh, of Tlaloc. She, it's either he or she, they're not sure. That was outside the moon pyramid at the very end of the site. And that's a Quinnemets and giant as well. Uh, they're also called the Quinines or the Quinnemets, slightly different names to them. But these go back very far in tradition. And even Hernan Cortes, when he came over in 1519, he heard stories about the giants. He was even shown a giant bone. and He had one in his possession, which was supposedly sent back to Spain. But what happened to that, we don't know. Um, and then we have all these news, news accounts of giants all across Mexico, up to 15 feet tall, giant bones, skulls, teeth, other such things. All along Baja California, you get it, you get it up in... Um, a Sonora Desert. We wrote about the Sonora story with uh, Paxson Hayes and from the Smithsonian in our book Giants on Record. And we're now I'm I'm currently just I'm working on uh, further writing projects. One of them is going to be focused on Mexico and Olmecs, but I'm looking at the giants of Mexico as a kind of focus. Um, so there's a lot going on with that here, and all the early traditions talk about this very strongly. All the Spanish conquistadors, they heard about it when they came over because the, the Aztecs were telling them all these old stories of these giants. And so there's, there's definitely something in that. Um, and, yeah, and it goes down into Guatemala. I've been showing photos from Honduras of a giant skeleton that may have been found at Capan. So even into Mayan times and Aztec times, some of these giants still existed. Well, this has been a fascinating interview, uh, Hugh. Thanks so much for uh, your time today. And for those uh, listening or watching, make sure and follow Hugh. He's on Instagram uh, at Hugh Newman one I believe. We just posted uh, a couple of his photos from Mexico. Uh, follow uh, the Megalithomania uh, Facebook group. Great group to jump in and, and see all of his videos. And then uh, what's the Megalithomania website, Hugh? Just megalithomania.co.uk. .co.uk. That's got links to his books. And I'm really excited about it. Sounds like your upcoming book. So, man, thanks again for your time. Keep up the great work. And we'll do this again, hopefully, in the future. All right. Thanks a lot, D. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.